Welcome to the Dear Applicants podcast, where we dive into practical tips, insightful interviews, and explore personal stories that will hopefully inspire and motivate you to pursue your dreams and achieve your university admission goals. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Dear Applicants. I am your host, Jonathan, and with me today is Isaac, who is going to introduce himself. So hi, I'm Isaac. I'm currently a strategist at IV Prep and I deal mainly with the earlier programs that we run like Hit Start and Discovery. So that's where most of my students would find me. Uh, In terms of my personal history, my education, I studied at the uh, starting all the way back in the beginning. I was at Hua Chong Institution from 2010 to 2015 where I took the Singapore A-levels. And then I went on to do my undergraduate degree in law from the University of Cambridge. And currently I'm studying medicine at Duke NUS Medical School in Singapore. So outside of that, in terms of my professional history, you could say, uh, I I, in NS, most people would be interested to know that I worked as a dental assistant, which is not a very commonly known vocation. Um, outside of that, uh, after in my free time, I actually started doing freelance academic tutoring. So I dealt with kids from primary one all the way until JC two up to uni, up to uni uh, in my spare time. Amongst my other professions, I've also been a coach, a fitness coach at F45 training, if anyone has ever been to that gym before. And I also, as of last year, worked at a dive shop for a while. So I was a, I'm sort of a qualified dive guide slash uh, assistant instructor type of person there. Uh, So that's what I like to do in my holidays when I have time to go abroad. Um, Other than that, yeah. Were you an F45 instructor? Oh, so that was kind of uh, after I finished my NS before I so went You're not doing to it anymore? Uni. So, no, no, I'm not. Oh. I'm, as you can tell from my not uh, the state of my physical body. Uh, I don't no, know, like CrossFit people anymore. come in like different, <laughs> different shapes and sizes. I have a couple of friends that do F45. So I was wondering if you guys frequented the same places. But uh, I think the biggest thing over there is, uh, from your introduction was the switch from law to medicine. Mm. I think that's something that a lot of people will be interested in. We take things chronologically mm-hmm. here, however, so they will unfortunately have to wait, although I think we can put a timestamp uh, that sort of where we jump to sure. it. Why don't we start at the beginning? I know you were at Hua Chong for a while, but before that you were at ACS Primary. Mm. Uh, what was it like growing, growing up, I guess, in Singapore? Why, why the switch from ACS to Hua Chong? Was it family? Was it pressure, friends? What was it? So I I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, I think what I picked up on is that you use the word switch and that really speaks to the fact that there is uh, perceived to be a very great cultural difference. It's not a natural progression from ACS to Hua Chong. So for those who need a bit more context, ACS is known to be a much more anglicized type of local school and Hua Chong, as the name suggests, translates into pretty much Chinese high school with its origins in uh, the deep dark past of Singapore when communists ran rampant in the streets. So I think actually, funnily enough, uh, when I moved from ACS to Hua Chong after my PSLE, it wasn't really my own decision. I very much wanted to go to ACSI with all my primary school buddies and have a great time over there. But it's actually something that my, my family basically gave me two choices, Hua Chong or RI. And so uh, being the loyal uh, the loyal ACS boy that I was, who was born and bred to hate Rafflesians, I chose the other option. And to take apart the other part of your question, which was about what it was like, I think culturally, there are other different places for sure. Like, you know, there's no smoke without fire when it comes to these mm. stereotypes. So ACS was, let's, let, let's, let me just give you an anecdote. In ACS, my my Chinese was considered one of the top few in my class. And when I moved over to Hua Chong, I was middling at best and really struggling. That's all I'll say without further context. I think that's a pretty big joke, <laughs> right? ACS yeah. boys and their Chinese skills. Was it the same guy that set up both schools? Uh, you mean ACS and Hua Chong? Yeah. No, no, I think, uh, no, definitely not, definitely not. Um, they, I think you're thinking about Tan Kaki. I am, yeah. <laughs> just because the, so so the MRT station in front of Hua Chong is named after him. Yeah, but, but he set up ACS. Yes. No, did he didn't set up ACS. The, he's just a very well-known philanthropist <laughs> who has an auditorium in every single school named after yeah, him. Yeah, I think so I'm getting not, my businessmen mixed up yeah, then. He's not a common founder. <laughs> yeah, in any case, we can take that out if it's yeah. relevant. But uh, uh, tell us about, yeah, tell, tell me about Hua Chong. Yeah, because you so, spent, I think, the... Well, I guess the most yeah the formative, more formative time, parts yeah. of my life there. So in Hua Chong, I think I 
I think I'll describe my extracurricular life and my um, my academic life a little bit separately. So I think in my academic life, I think I was still uh, very much a very much an easy boy. I did I did very humanities related things. So mm-hmm. uh, as of secondary three all the way until JC two, I was part of the humanities program. Okay. So it's uh, under MOE in JC one and JC two, and prior to that in upper secondary, it's run internally within the school. So I think I was just naturally a little bit more inclined to the languages and my humanities subjects. So that's just the route I take and I took, and that's what. That's, those are the subjects I tended to fare better in without giving much of a thought, actually. So that's where my academic journey took me. Uh, in terms of extracurriculars, I think the main defining one of my childhood would be I was in canoeing. So for, for all six years of my uh, secondary school life. So it was a pretty intensive CCA. It took up about, I think we were training anything between three to ten times a week. Where were for, you training? Uh, so MacRitchie Reservoir ah, and okay. the Kalang Basin were our favorite haunts. And so we train anytime between yeah, three, to t- three to ten times a week. So I saw that more than I saw school most, most of the time. And I think, I mean, we were quite competitive. So lots of the time was training for both national, international competitions as well. Uh, made some good friends, uh, suffered a lot under the sun. But I think I remember a lot of lessons from, lessons from there. I think outside of that as well, I was in... So why yeah. canoeing? So I, oh, I can, fairly atypical, isn't it? Um, it's. I wouldn't say it's entirely. I can walk you through my thirteen-year-old sure. thought process. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I actually first joined the CCA judo in Sec One for a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my main thought was that I wanted to join a sport. I wasn't, I, I was somewhat of a chubby kid when I was in primary school and I wanted to join a sport. But then, as you know, with things like badminton and soccer and basketball, uh, people are already good at them. So mm. the, the great thing you get from a well-resourced school like Hua Chung is that you've got lots of obscure CCAs from sports that no one has ever heard of. So things like, you know, uh, things like canoeing. I think. And then so I just tried, I tried, but before that, I went to judo. And then I noticed that I was the smallest sized kid in that team. I had a bit of a late growth spurt. <laughs> so as much as I was reasonably fit and everything like that, I wasn't a fan of it. I wasn't a fan of getting flung around so much. And also primarily, I wanted to get tenor skin. So I joined canoeing the next year. Uh, <laughs> that was the only thought process. But I really took a liking to it. And I think the most, the thing that kept me in was we had a coach who was a uh, absolute fanatic uh, in a lot of good ways and a lot of bad ways. So he was an ultra marathon runner. He's the sort of guy, and by ultra marathon, I don't mean the, the, the 50 kilometer sort, like the 200 kilometer sort of ultra marathoner. And so we were put through quite the training regime. Uh, if I were to put it nicely, it, it was very character building, but at the same time, it also involved things like uh, watching sports films day in and day out and then getting to do what push-ups. Were, what were his were. favorite sports Oh, films? so his favorite one was, I forgot the name, but it's about the Oxford-Cambridge boat race. And one of his favorite quotes that came up from there was the quote that when to be second is to be last. And it came off, he'd love to use it completely out of context because he used it to mean that if we got a silver medal, it was completely it was like, unsatisfactory. Was like, <laughs> but the thing is that in that movie, right, in that race, last, there are yeah, only yeah, two yeah, people two racing. So it means literally to be second is to be last. So he, it, it was quite fanatical. He made uh, me and my, uh, my, my boat partner. So I was rowing in pairs in my, one of my championships in sec three. So after we flunked out of the finals, he made us go for an eight kilometer run as our punishment. And uh, yeah, there's, there's that sort of thing. That sort of thing. It's run pretty much like a Chinese gymnastics. I don't think team. I've ever run eight kilometers yeah. straight in my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think he he instilled quite a work ethic that stayed with me for life. Uh, instilled a lot of other things that stayed for life. But work ethic was one of them. And so I think you you really bond over these experiences and over the winning, the losing, the blood, sweat, and tears. So that's a really big part of my youth growing up. Actually, tell us a little bit more about your other extracurricular since you already mm. segued the. Yeah, so I was in, maybe we can start from upper secondary, I guess. So that was when I started being a little bit more active outside of sports. So I was in student council in Sec 4. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I never considered applying before that. But I think somewhere around Sec 4, I started thinking that there's a point where I'm going to graduate JC and there's a point where I can't just be mucking around the reservoir forever. So I need to be applying to places and I need things to, to show that I have skills other than... Oh, so it was a bit of a conscious decision to branch out. somewhat conscious, okay. yes. Because honestly, if I had my way, I would probably be training Canoeing for, 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 life, for, yeah. for, for, for all of eternity. Or watching sports movies. Yes, probably, probably. And getting made to do push-ups or being too rowdy while watching the sports movies. But um, yeah, so that's when I joined Student Council uh, 
uh, and then beyond that in JC1, I joined the History and Current Affairs Society in my school. So as so so to kind of like break it down, what we did in that in that society was there's a few different buckets. So one of them was Model UN. So mm-hmm. lots of conferences that we got sent for. Uh, I organized some myself as well. I went I on a trip part of as the, well. Sort of yeah, I was committee part of the leadership committee. And there did you also... like being a delegate more, or did you enjoy sort of running a conference yourself, running a committee? I think I. Chairing the letter, for sure. The oh, letter, okay. definitely. Because I think... The power dynamic. <laughs> I make it sound like a power free, but then I am <laughs> not. I think what I really liked was not so much that... It's not so much like a clear dichotomy between leadership versus, I guess, operational, so to speak. It's more that I enjoy progressing to sharing my knowledge and being able to create things after being a participant sure. that made me feel like I enjoyed it a lot better because I think for a while you know you you, you debate and then there are people you know you're all kids right so you're just like oh, I'm gonna win you're gonna win yeah you but see then, the same guys over and over correct, again correct. The same and girl. yeah and it's just a small community so you kind of want to just progress in terms of your skill set mm-hmm. and I think that was partially a conscious effort in terms of building my profile but also it was just a desire to see something new. So I think the main two things that I enjoyed the most about that leadership position was I got to enjoy, I got to organize a a trip to South Korea that was completely planned from scratch. So basically they used to send people to this uh, conference in the Netherlands every single year. But that year, I think something about the sponsorship or the partnership uh, just didn't go through that year. So me and my other ex-school member who were in charge of Model UN were tasked with sourcing for one new conference anywhere across the world and to just plan it from scratch. And so we basically had the full freedom to plan a new trip. And we chose, uh, we chose, we first chose, I think it was somewhere in Florida, but it was so expensive because the school only sponsors Asian trips a lot more generously. So we decided to go to Seoul instead because me and my friends really wanted to sightsee. So we <laughs> we planned a trip to Seoul and then we we brought a bunch of uh, our juniors who are delegates over there. A bunch of them won some awards, which was, which was really nice. And the other thing that was fun about JC was to organize our own model UN conference in school. It wasn't known as one of the, you know, the biggest or the fanciest or anything like that. But I think it was a really nice uh, experience to kind of get into the teeth of the logistical details, organizing teams and parallel timelines and all that. It's a lot more fun than, you know, just arguing back and forth, even though even though it was fun at the point. Other than that, I would say that I, w- I would say that part of the role also involved things like uh, interviewing new committee members, just taking a slightly more leadership or supervisory role, which is quite, which is something that I think I think you learn how to deal with autonomy at a young age, which is which is nice to see how uh, that that sort of a student organization goes through its entire life cycle. So I think that was a little bit more fulfilling for me. If we can pause for a second. So you did MUN, mm. I did MUN. Yeah. Most of our humanities students yeah. have done MUN. If we walk outside the door and just ask people at random, chances are yeah. they've done it. Yeah. What What's the point of it anymore? If it's done, <laughs> you know, just, you know, people are sort of, you know, it's, a, it's an overdone stake at this point. What, what did you get mm. out of MUN? I think what I got out of MUN was, you could divide it into too, too many areas, I think. I think the first area would be just oratorical skills and speaking. I would say that, honestly, that very frankly speaking, it I wasn't that confident of a public speaker at all. I get huge anxiety when I go up on stage and everything like that. Yeah, somehow I emceed for a lot of school events, but but I yeah, that, that just happened. But then, but I think Mono Yun just helped that quite a lot more because it's a lot more dynamic than just a, I guess, like a two-way debate, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Uh, and at the same time, you kind of have to deal with multiple people at the same time. So, I mean, it isn't exactly some sort of training ground for right. future statesmen or something like that. Very far from the truth. But I think it's one of many activities that one does in their youth and it just broadens your your mind and skill set. I think the second thing also is just meeting new people as well. So I think uh, there's there's a huge range of people from a huge range of backgrounds, international schools, local schools, everything. And you just, and, and it gave me the opportunity to travel abroad as well. So I think all those were pretty eye-opening opportunities in terms of a more 
from a more soft skills and soft experiences kind of perspective. So it was sort of like a conduit for these various skills that you yeah, were then able yeah. to. So it's sort of like a sandbox, right? Or yeah, playground where the exactly, things are available exactly. to you, but then it, it's yeah. you who has to go and make yeah. use of them or take them. Yeah. Before we continue, I would like to take a quick break to remind you to subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review on your favorite platform. Your feedback helps us improve and to reach a wider audience to provide further insight into this arduous journey. Also, if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, feel free to email us at our email linked in the description below. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. Yeah. So and you can see like many things are conduit. Sport is a conduit. Um, academic competitions are a conduit as well. So it's just, I mean, getting engaged in different gainful activities. Yeah, well, that, I, but I guess it's like, for example, yeah. sports or even things like debate, it's harder for you to disappear, right? Yeah. I, at yeah, an MUN conference, I remember absolutely. my first one, I'm also someone that, that doesn't deal too well if this was a live recording, I'd be like yeah, jittery yeah. As, as hell, right? Um, I, so MUN is something that you can disappear into the background and not say anything. Debate, you're forced yeah, to do something, yeah. which is why the question about... So, yeah, I mean, obviously, you've made it very clear you were doing multiple things, but what can mm. you get out of debate? And I think that's, you, you made that quite clear yeah. um, as well. So apart from the humanities CCA, well, what else was going on with you? Well, along the side, I was also involved in some service-related uh, mm -hmm. commitments. So, but those, I think, I think as with most people in JCL, I would right away admit that none of them were particularly well thought through. They're mostly things that you know were available at the time. So, I don't know if this is still running, but we did this youth for causes project. I think it's still, running, I think yeah. still running. Yeah. So, we did this youth for causes project where we were trying to raise funds for uh, the the the. Association for Mental Health. Mm -hmm. So me and my group mates were like making these little mental well-being badges that we're trying to sell. Uh, not very effectively. Uh, another point in time, I went on like a overseas overseas CIP trip. I went to involve myself in. So so to some extent also, I tried to interweave the service related opportunities with things I was already doing as well. So in canoeing, we actually had this flagship event every year, which is called this twenty four hour kayaking challenge, where we raise funds for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. That does not involve all of us paddling for twenty four hours That's straight. Just, okay. just a team. Is just to clarify, it's a collective twenty four hours. <laughs> so we have these and also it's not on the water we have these kayaking that like these rowing machines essentially that you kind of take turns going on and then you just keep it going for 24 hours so um we were part of like the planning publicity and fundraising outreach efforts and it's all a good that. title though i have to say yeah it's it, it was fun 24 it was hours fun. yeah <laughs> it's a good it's a catchy title everyone thinks we paddle so for 24 great hours but yeah. we don't <laughs> and for for model un as well we also uh, donated the proceeds for from our conference to UN Women Singapore. So I tried to weave in that sort of uh, community element into my other activities as well. Because I think that after doing my very first beach cleanup, I, I realized that not all the activities that come our way are necessarily very... Uh, they don't have that longitudinal aspect and there's not really much meaning for the beneficiaries nor for yourself. So I think I was trying to see how I can develop a community aspect to the activities I was involved in as well. Yeah, and I think aside from that, another hallmark of my secondary school years was, because I'm remembering like why I wasn't, did I feel as if I didn't do a lot of things in school? It's also because I was overseas a lot of the time. So we were privileged to have to, been, to have been given a lot of opportunities in all aspects. And these were overseas travel. trips to, to where? Uh, I'm sure so there were a bunch too. There, there were a bunch. So I think to start with, uh, the furthest I've been is to San Francisco for school. to UC Berkeley for a six week uh, sort of it, it was something that my school was trying out. They, they sent four of us there to just take part in this writing workshop okay. that they were holding at the university for kids. Non-fiction? Uh, fiction. Non-fiction, non-fiction. It's like an academic writing sort okay. of workshop. We did that when we were in sec three. So we basically stayed there for six weeks and attended two, three hour classes a week. I think something about the math didn't add up for the school. So they never ran it for anyone else after. But a great time in San Francisco, made a bunch of friends. Like two days on, five days yeah, on. Yeah, in sec four, time. we went to the UK for a humanities learning journey. So we went to things like the... I think Strat Stratford upon Avon, mm. uh, London, uh, Manchester. Apparently, going to the Menu Stadium was part of the humanities learning trip as well. So it's quite fun. Uh, and then uh, I also got the chance to go to Hong Kong on an exchange program. I went to Sri Lanka on another humanities exchange program in JC. What were you guys doing in Sri Lanka? Uh, sorry. What were you doing in Sri Lanka? Um, 
well, we had a lot of buffet meals. <laughs> Apart from that, so so to kind of like tag Wait, it where back were you to in Colombo? Yes, we're in Colombo, uh, Candy, uh, and I grew up there. You know, oh, you grew up in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Oh, it's a, it's a beautiful Loved place. It. Great. Beautiful My sister place. was born there. Yeah. So she she likes to tell everybody that she's Sri Lankan, even though I see, uh, <laughs> even though you're getting a passport only by. I see, by defense, I see. right? So she very much has an Indian passport, but she oh. she likes to sort of flip her hair and go, "I'm Sri Lankan." Exoticize. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was really fun because I mean, we we learned about a little bit about the uh, Sri Lankan civil war. Looked at some of the museums. That's uh, why we left. Yeah, I mean, John. <laughs> yeah, his history history anthropomorphized, <laughs> you know. But then, but no, then no, 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 it was sort of interesting because my da- my dad used yeah. to be on flight. He go away for like a week, yeah. week and a half. So my mom and like six year old me, mm. 2007, seven year old me. Um, and my sister was like yeah. in swaddling clothes, right? And these like armed guards would come in and knock on the oh, door, and my no. mom would be like, ah, "No!" and shut the door. So then she flipped out and was like, "Okay, we are going to leave." And then the next year, the war ended, and we were like, "Can we go back?" Oh, and my wow. dad was like, "Yeah, maybe not." Wow, so was, uh, <laughs> such a pity. We we all loved it. That is one one story to tell. That is yeah, one story to tell. Oh yeah, so so yeah, we had we had that, and then we had a look at. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's. In pretty much every part of the world, there's more geography to be learned than in Singapore, so there's not much more explanation than that. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, we basically had a ten day trip. Bukit Timah, wild, wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the exotic wildlife. But to be fair, the oceans and the, the rock, Bukit Timah. Ah, yes, the rock. But to be fair, our oceans are very biodiverse, which we can go into later. But anyway, there are still things in the oceans. They're covered in algae, but there are lots of things like oil. Um, like I saw three sharks on Saturday. Ah. <laughs> I saw three shots. Well, to be fair, to be fair, I have had friends yeah. that were like windsurfing off the coast, and they said, "Oh, there were dolphins." I was like, "Huh? Oh, oh no way!" I was. Yeah, I too. I was also like, "Where was I that day? Sitting at home yeah. doing nothing in particular." <laughs> but yeah, sharks. Where? Yeah. Uh, so most people. Oh, we... like the small sharks. Uh, yeah, yeah, not like the oh. jaws megalodon <laughs> kind of sharks, like <laughs> the the little cute sharks that hide under rocks. But but it's a really rare occurrence, like really really rare. But I was... this is, you go to uh, Bedok Jetty, and they have that entire like list of fish that yeah. you can and cannot yeah. uh, sort of yeah. keep, right? So the, I think the sharks are one yeah. of them that like, yeah. please throw it's, it back. You definitely can't right? keep a shark. You definitely can't keep a shark. But oh yeah, where was I? Uh, overseas trips as well. So I went to Cambodia for overseas uh, CIP as well. Uh, I got the chance to go to go to Penang for a, for a dragon boat competition. Oh, I, so you were dragon boating as well? Yeah, yeah, I was dragon boating. It's like what we do in Kanui when we're in off season. So anything with a pedal and a and water kind of is right, 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 right. yeah and then got to go to uh got to go to i meant I, I think i already mentioned so Korea, yeah. model un and the netherlands as well the year before um it, it's a huge it's a huge conference so i mean what, what you were saying just now about being able to disappear that's absolutely right because i spend most of my afternoons eating stroop waffles with my friend in the hotel room instead of i mean most of sessions. my school when they went for mun conference so, yeah. holiday right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but it was a really really beautiful place and yeah, I had a good time. So there were all these opportunities that I think I was very grateful for that complemented my classroom learning along the way. And there's something that we've talked about mm. outside of this room, outside, outside yeah. of the cameras rolling, which was your work with uh, a particular migrant workers organization, yeah. which you felt was pretty foundational right, and fundamental yes. to your own personal yes. growth. Do uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. So let, let me start chronologically sure. in 2016 when I was doing my doing my military service. So oh, this was after school. It was after school. It wasn't oh, during okay. school. Okay. So uh, so this came during NS actually. Mm-hmm. So given that I was put in a you know it, it, it was a kind of as a blessing or a curse or whatever, but I was put in a in a vocation that gave me a decent amount of time outside. So I was looking to volunteer during that time. And I think I was just trying to think out of the box a little bit more in terms of, you know, just to get exposure. And, you know, in school, there are a few typical things you always get uh, signed up for, like old folks' homes and that sort of thing is very, very powerful for the course. But then I was researching a little bit more uh, and I think this migrant work, the migrant worker scene and community was something that sort of appealed to me because, first of all, it was an, it was a numbers thing because about 20% of our population here is non-local, yeah. right? I mean, it's not like the UAE or anything, but 20% is a big number. And 
I realized I knew very little about them. But at the same time, after reading a bit more, I knew that they faced a lot of very multifaceted issues. So I went, I started at TWC2 in 2016, uh, doing some very basic roles. So just uh, being a part of their meal program, uh, having to, you know, just process cases. The cover project. Cover mm. project, yeah. And then... And then as I spent a little bit more time there, I started doing a few human interest pieces for their website, doing a little bit of research with them as well. Because after encountering the, the workers face-to-face, -face, you know, you start thinking about, okay, how, how can I get a deeper understanding of them and how can I contribute in a bigger way other than dishing out meal coupons, right? So I started learning about the main issues they face. So namely things like employment disputes, things like work injury settlements and things like that. And I think these are... Uh, with these issues, much more that as as much as things like the other the other vulnerable groups in our society, you realize that there's a lot of uh, policy level implications, a lot of uh, things in the system that lead up lead up to that cultural things, political things, uh, policy loopholes that we are always trying to plug. So I started doing some human interest pieces. So one of my one of my most more memorable ones was that we actually did a little bit of a mini series about the fact that migrant workers, and unlike you know you or me, if we decide to leave a job, we just we can afford to be a bit of a bum for a while, look around on Job Street. But then for migrant workers, immigration status is tied to employment status, yeah. right? So, so very much like it is, let's say, in lots of the Middle East. But essentially... Mine the too, by the way. <laughs> Same bullshit. <Yeah. laughs> okay. So... so <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I have to disagree with your statement. But yeah. yeah. I'm so yeah. scared. So... <laughs> Before you get deported. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, I mean, the difficulty with a lot of them is, for, for a lot of them, is that when they go through a, when, when they go through some sort of issue with work, whether it's their fault, the employer's fault, or there's no one really to blame. Mm -hmm. They're caught in a compensation people. claim. Yeah. yeah, correct. And they would have to go through a very, very difficult process to come back in Singapore again. So we were kind of looking into if there's a way to streamline the process of helping these workers go from one employer to the other because, you know, it's mutually beneficial. The government doesn't have to deal with a reprocessing of an immigrant, uh, a new immigrant. The companies can trust that there's someone who's already skilled come, coming with a referral. It helps the workers because they don't have to fork out thousands of more dollars. So we are doing a bit of a uh, human interest piece on that as well. So moving on from there, actually, I stopped this volunteering project when I moved abroad for university. And like most things in NS, they just feel like a fever dream that you never think about ever again. Uh, but interestingly enough, I, I came back during uh, COVID because, you know, everyone was remote learning at the time. And something caught my eye in the news, which was that it it I, I came to know that migrant workers were really very much a part of the population that was very uh, adversely affected by very adversely affected by COVID, whether it's from a work point of view or from a from a health policy point of view and all that. So I wanted to get involved with this again because I mean, yeah, it was it was a really I had a really meaningful time learning about them and serving them back in NS. So I came back to another migrant worker organization. So it's called a. Uh, COVID uh, Migrant Support Coalition. So it was actually a new NGO that is a coalition of a few existing ones. So including places like... Uh, raining uh, Green Coast. Yeah, Raining Green Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're one of the main ones. And then uh, Welcome in My Back. Yeah, there, there's a few like quite grassroots ones that kind of banded together to make a more cohesive body. And so what I did for them was uh, during the initial part of COVID, I went around delivering essential items to dorms. So I was just in a, in a car, just sending, sending things like... Mm, uh, yeah clothing and donated donated electrical items and things like that but further on I wanted to you know be of a greater help at a at a higher more policy level so I joined their, their their casework team as well as their legal research and policy team so at the at the end of it we spent a lot of time consolidating cases and I was one of the the main the, the main members in terms of running the other the work that the other case workers do as well as collating the policy observations that we had so all of these policy observations they're not from things like empirical data or scientific studies or anything they're things that our case workers anecdotal and anecdotal data and all that which yeah, is so, all you have access to yeah right? exactly so we came up with some policy suggestions as well in collaboration with the, with the government with other NGOs to just oh, okay so there were yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, so there were people on board with this and it was quite a comprehensive proposal. So issues like uh, transport safety, things like uh, what, 
how how to implement sort of a standard for dormitory mm-hmm. living arrangements, uh, health policy, access to healthcare, and all that. And I think throughout the COVID crisis, you really see these things developing as well. I mean, it's it's not not it's it's hard to entangle to to sort of untangle disentangle who's responsible for what and all that. But you see a lot of different policy changes emerging from this area. So I think it's quite. It's quite nice to see the whole area developing. And as with everything, there's areas for improvement, as always. But to see that this is how I think the government, individual stakeholders, NGOs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and most importantly, the beneficiaries themselves come together to make a constructive discussion for this community moving forward. I think that's something that was quite inspiring to me. And I think other than that, this is also... So this, I'm, I'm kind of going off on a tangent. This is no, sort okay. of when I started manifesting my interest in medicine. Maybe manifesting is not a good word for it, but <laughs> the, the, the interest in medicine started manifesting. Yeah. So, so then I decided to also explore the if health you aspect. Hear the, you heard the whispers in your yes, ear. Yes, <laughs> I heard the medicine whispers, yeah. you know, like Hippocrates whispering in my ear. So, so, so I started exploring <laughs> the medical side of the issues that these workers face as well. So this, and, and this was something that was kind of implanted in my, in my mind from very long ago, because the, one of the biggest issues they face is healthcare and employment status in the wake of a work injury. So I volunteered for this, uh, health, this organization called HealthServe. They run a migrant worker clinic in Geylang. It's still very much up and running and growing year by year. And so I did a two month internship with that clinic just to, you know, be in a clinical setting for these, for this group of people. And they serve only migrant workers. So it was very interesting to see how clinical medicine is practiced. Uh, <coughs> as a formative experience, but also to see how it's applied to the very specific needs of a community. So the kinds of issues that they face, what kind of issues do they come with that are uh, influenced by the fact that, you know, they don't receive the same vaccinations, the same access to healthcare that they do in their own countries, awareness of chronic diseases, uh, the fact that some of them come here instead of going to the emergency department where they sh- very rightly should, because that's the only place they know to go. Um, things like wrestling with the cost of healthcare and all that. So I think that was a really great great experience both for both clinically and in terms of my So you actually had hands-on experience it wasn't more policy related stuff No right? so it was very much a clinical experience okay. at the same time so I think this is a quick summary of my involvement Yeah it wasn't very worker. quick but, but great right yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's super in yeah. super in depth and I think there's a lot of well first of all I think it was an, a, quite an amazing story in and of itself there's a lot that I want to ask about hmm. um so I think it was quite a productive time that you had working with these organizations. Very much, very much so. uh, first and foremost, because a lot came out of it, mm-hmm. right? There were sort of tangible elements that yeah. were delivered to, to people that needed it, uh, policy proposals that were worked on, I hope. There yes, were some yes, outcomes yes, yes, there there was that, a, that, there was that a resulted yes, in, right. in you know policy change of some sort. But also personally mm-hmm. for you, it was quite a, uh, quite a developing time, right? And mm-hmm. I think you, you were able to... To explore your interest in both law and medicine during that time, yeah. one as a caseworker working on the more sort of legal mm. uh, briefs and policy proposal stuff, but then also the clinical experiences. That's all for today's episode of Dear Applicants. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you found the content valuable and insightful. If you'd like to learn more about our guests or the topics we discussed, be sure to check out our show notes for links and further resources.